Good morning. Good morning, John and David and entrepreneurs, and welcome to all those who have traveled from China for this summit. I apologize for not being with you in person. I'm actually in South Korea when this will be played for you. But please accept my warm greetings and welcome to our company's Roy Hill headquarters. This is our state-of-the-art award-winning remote operations center. Earlier today, I presented also via film at the Global Food Forum, speaking particularly about the agricultural industry and Australia's opportunity, provided we can remain price competitive and can reduce Australia's government tape and burdens to become a food production powerhouse. If we can do this, we could supply much needed food for our neighbors and the world's growing population. Should you wish, you could view on our company website. Today we will be looking forward to hearing from our friends in China, who are of course far better equipped to speak on their first-hand knowledge about their own country than I am, a mere visitor. So I will focus my talk on Australian issues. And firstly, I need to speak to you about spending beyond our means, also called ski, given that our Australian governments are putting the next generations in debt. This is exactly what Australia is doing, and will be doing even more rapidly if it weren't for the considerable contribution of entrepreneurs. Those gathered together today should know what continuing reduction in investment into Australia does. It certainly doesn't provide more sustainable jobs, greater revenue or raise living standards. Only a few weeks ago, the Chief Financial Officer Peter Bevan of BHP Billiton, one of the largest companies operating in Australia, with a long history of major investments here, warned that while Australia's costs are too high and referred to government burdens as part of this, BHP Billiton may have to reconsider investing further in Australia. We need to explain the benefits of lower tape and taxes, more investment, more jobs, and yes, data shows, more revenue, which means more money for our hospitals, defense, police, and growing proportion of elderly. And we need to battle propaganda that lower company taxes don't just benefit a few wealthy people, but all those mums and dads who have shares in companies, those wanting jobs, and all those who have superannuation, given our supers invest in company shares. The history of this country tells us that revenue is not created by government, but by entrepreneurs. Fortunately, we have so much we can learn from our amazing history of entrepreneurs. Let's start with just some of my favorites. So Sidney Kidman, and my mother's father, James Nicholas. Both men lost their fathers at an early age and had to go out in the Aussie outback to find work and create and build their empires. Young Sydney, at about 13, with a little education, set off into the outback, hoping to find his older brother on his one-eyed horse, Cyclops, with little bit the clothes he was wearing, a rope, a thin small blanket, and a shilling or two. Not instantly, but through hardship, decades of sacrifice, hard work and much risk, learning firsthand through polite questions and a retentive memory, Sir Sidney created the largest land empire this country has ever seen, with approximately 100 stations, I'm told around 340,000 square kilometers. These stations were mainly held by him, a few of them in partnership. Sidney Kidman became the then largest private landholder in the world. It is said that no single person has since exceeded the scale of these private holdings. I don't have time to go into this outstanding entrepreneurial history as sufficiently as it deserves, but those who are interested should get hold of the audio version of The Cattle King. It was extra special for me to hear this audio version, as my mother's father, James Nicholas, is represented, talking then young Kidman into recognizing the opportunity Mineral Finds would present to the coaching business, and talked his friend into partnering with him, supplying horses. Together they rapidly expanded the coaching business, until Kidman later sold. 
Times have changed for today's entrepreneurs, but still important fundamentals remain, grasping opportunities, even though this means risk, hard work, dedication, and more. My grandfather, after his father was killed, also when he was around 12, had to walk about 11 miles each day to the nearest employment, that being Cobb & Co, which was a bit like Wells Fargo of the USA. He cleaned horse stables to support his widowed mother and two younger sisters. Sometimes he was so tired that he couldn't walk back home, falling asleep on the stable floors without dinner. But from that start, he got to know the coaching business well, and from stable sweeper, grew to become manager for Cobb & Co of four states, until he went into the coaching business with Sidney Kidman, and then for himself. From James Nicholas's poor start, he built thousands of miles of roads and many inns, opening up parts of our country, supplying people in remote areas with mail, much needed equipment, water, passenger services and more. But he didn't stop at coaching. He said he got to know horses so well, sitting driving the Cobb Co coaches, seeing how they moved, that he raced some of his horses in Australia, Singapore, Brunei and London. When visiting London for the racing, he observed their buses and designed and brought the first buses to West Australia. He also became the largest landowner in West Australia, but sadly his health failed and he died at a young age around 50, younger than his good friend Sir Sidney Kidman. More favourite entrepreneurs who helped build our country include Michael Kalis and the Paspali family both Greek family backgrounds and both in the fishing and pearling industries. I well remember Mick telling me of his start, wanting to work hard to bring his mother out of poverty. Initially, when he was fishing in the north, he didn't have enough people to clean the fishy court, so he approached the local jail and made a deal to take the prisoners out during the day so they could work, then was responsible for returning them to jail each night. Both Mick Kalis and Nick Paspali went on to become the largest providers of top quality fish and pearls in our country, supplying to Asia and other countries. I wonder if you're thinking what I am. With all the government red tape in Australia today, would these amazing Aussie entrepreneurs have been able to do what they did, creating great businesses and livelihoods for their families and thousands of others, and without any sense of entitlement or handouts. And let's ask, where would our country be if these entrepreneurs had been bogged down with as much red tape as today? Certainly not providing the investment opportunities, jobs and revenue that they did, that raised our standards of living. Wouldn't it be great if these entrepreneurs' true stories were known in our schools and universities and understood throughout our country today? I was recounting some of the contents of this speech to some friends of mine recently, and one said in effect, our government is really letting us down. Too much tape, too much taxation, both adding to our costs and sending investment to other countries with less of these problems. And another said that government shouldn't be the enemy of entrepreneurs who create the wealth for the country before it can be distributed. Can't help but agree with all that. But then one also added, and our government should also be talking about Aussie values. I was a bit surprised by this. Sometimes we expect too much from our governments. My view is that such role is better for leaders outside of government such as entrepreneurs. Let's also remember the old saying, quote, businesses get the government they deserve, end quote. So please, Aussies, also take that away with you from this entrepreneurs conference, as the fundamental problems we have in Australia now really need your voice and action. At a Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, Chogham, I remember how one government minister was telling the Commonwealth audience how Australia doesn't suffer from large numbers of government regulations and how we welcome investment. After the Minister's speech, I had been invited to speak, 
and I spoke about our then Tad's Corner coal project in Queensland, the first coal project to ship coal from the Galilee Basin. Behind me rolled the list of government approvals, licenses and permits we had to achieve, over 5,000 of them. I was told the minister's face showed more and more discomfort as the red tape list rolled on and on. I'm not saying the minister was being dishonest, just that even ministers are so out of touch and even while in government and simply don't know the burden their governments are placing on businesses and the cumulative negative effect government tape has on investment. At the time, I had a quarter of my Queensland office working on undertaking the minefield of government permits, approvals and licences for this project, taking years to achieve. But had we got the project off the ground pre the thermal coal price crash, would have seen investment of billions of dollars, thousands of jobs, many more indirectly, and much needed export revenue. When we were undertaking the bankable feasibility for this major coal project, I asked my team, how many government approvals and licenses do we need for this project? They said we have found more than a thousand. This is quite a lot for a small company to handle, but I gave the go ahead. A few months later, when I was asking about their progress, my team, rather uncomfortable, said, we're sorry, but we have found that there are actually over 3,000 approvals, permits and licenses required. Then later, when I returned for the grand opening of the pit as part of the feasibility, the first mining pit in the Galilee, I asked how the approvals, etc., were going and was informed that we required more than 5,000 I've told this as it happened, just to point out, even businesses don't know the extent of government tape we're burdened with. There's no book A to Z with all tape required, but heaven help us if we leave out or don't timely do some. Some of these are briefly described as more than 5,000, required hundreds or even thousands of pages to be submitted. Do we really think all this is even read? When I was in India, co-launching my second book with an international leader I greatly admire for his actions on cutting government tape, Prime Minister Modi, whose famous and important saying I borrowed from my book, quote, from red tape to red carpet, end quote. One of Australia's ex-Prime Ministers was in the audience. I asked the ex-Prime Minister, how many approvals, permits and licenses do you think we needed for our Roy Hill? prior to construction even commencing. He replied, about 40. Roy Hill is Hancock Prospecting's majority owned US 10 billion mega iron ore operation, ramping up to be Australia's single largest iron ore mine, producing 55 million tonnes of ore per annum. Who, if they knew at the start of investing their money and years into a project, coping with many risks and uncertainties, foreign exchange movements, cyclones, price crashes, Australia's high costs, strikes and much more, that over 5,000 approvals, permits and licences would be required, would actually continue to develop such a project. Roy Hill required not 40, but more than 4,000 time-consuming approvals, permits and licences before we could even start construction and then even more were required for construction. What small or medium-sized company, indeed what entrepreneur, if they knew, would then proceed or be able to cope with that? The reality is our government regulations are stifling entrepreneurship and blocking small and medium-sized companies from being able to even consider undertaking projects of significance. And what should frighten all Australians more tape has been added since the immense examples I've mentioned. And who can think we're safe from even more? What should entrepreneurs do? Let's remind our governments that the USA president went around their country asking what the people wanted. He heard that they wanted America to be great again. And when asked what it would take to do that, their answers were clear, less tape, less taxation. 
He promised exactly that and had a stunning victory, despite unfair and grossly negative media. I guess I should include a little more about what the companies I'm executive chairman of are doing. We're not trying to deal with ever-increasing government paperwork. We are investing in practical technology across our stations, extending what we've done and are doing on our own stations into the recently acquired Kidman stations, which we now own together with a Chinese company, Shanghai Cred. And in mining, specifically at our Roy Hill Iron Ore operation in the Pilbara, Roy Hill uses innovative, practical technology across its vast operations, stretching over 344 kilometres, with its own integrated low phosphorus iron ore mine, 344 kilometre heavy haul railway system, and purpose built port facilities. This project has marked a number of firsts, such as launching the world's first fleet of pink mining trucks in an effort to assist breast cancer, and the largest commercial deal between Australia and South Korea. And Roy Hill also is the first in the Pilbara and West Australia to reach in record time 30 million tonnes of ore, which it did last month. And we expect we will soon also be the first project to reach 40 million tonnes in record time. This isn't a bad first when you consider that we compete with BHP Billiton and Rio Tinto, two of the largest mining companies in the world. Roy Hill also marked an entrepreneurial first when it achieved the largest ever private land-based mining and infrastructure project, debt financing deal borrowing more than US 7 billion from 19 major banks, including the world's largest bank, ICBC, and other Chinese banks, including the Bank of China, and five export credit agencies. We are also operating some of the biggest equipment ever built in the world, much of which was built in China, and are pleased to have established an above average performance where safety is concerned, be that in comparison with Pilbara operators, West Australian or nationally. Our high-tech remote operations centre facility in Perth receives drone footage from the site, allowing staff to see in real time operations in our north, and our centre provides end-to-end -end integration of Roy Hill's operations, enabling a coordinated and integrated approach to the planning, scheduling and operation of the mining, processing, rail and port operations approximately a thousand miles away. Robotic laboratory product sampling, auto-refueling, tele-remote doses, autonomous drilling, remote train control and drones are just some of the new technologies we use across the Roy Hill project. Drones in particular we have invested in and adapted so their functionality is enhanced, allowing us to do multiple things such as monitor mining, environmental and maintenance activity, as well as incident investigation and measuring stockpiles of iron ore that are ready to be loaded as we drive towards becoming a 55 million tonnes per annum operation, the largest single mine in West Australia. However, we cannot be complacent or naive and assume that our location in the Asian region is enough to guarantee successful exports. Donald has trumped Australia on taxes. The Indian Prime Minister is cutting tape and leading Indians onto the red carpet. We need to catch up, don't we? Could you imagine Prime Minister Modi knowing tape cutting was critical to raise his people's standards of living, putting this in the too hard basket, given his country's notorious bureaucracy, with tape crafted by the British and the USSR? Wouldn't you think cutting Australia's red tape would be comparatively easy? Prime Minister Modi didn't sit back muddling around or ignoring. He slashed red tape, which doubled India's economic growth, lowered inflation, lowered government debt, and achieved becoming the fastest growing economy in the world. With a flourishing technology industry, raising living standards of his people and lifting many out of the misery of poverty. Yet our Australian governments prefer to misinterpret that their red tape is not a burden, nor holding businesses back. I'll give you another little example.
On some roads in South Australia, cattle producers are only allowed to haul up to two trailers behind a truck between stations and to meet works, not the three permitted on outback roads in other states such as WA and Queensland. If the South Australian government allowed us to use three trailers like other states, we would then have a third less trucks on the road meaning less damage to roads and less costs for fuel and trucking, transportation. These are the sort of red tape burdens that should be recognised to add costs. Any that act to restrict water, especially for our animals in our very hot outback, are even more concerning. How much more productive would our agriculture and other primary sectors and export sectors be if we could focus our attention on investing in and growing agribusiness and other primary and export businesses, rather than wasteful government paperwork and complying with endless and growing regulations. We all can see the demand curve and most understand the opportunities, but for Australia to be a part of such exciting opportunities, it all gets back to this. We need to firstly focus on those two T's, practical technology and, with the help of active entrepreneurs, tackle the second T, achieve on the government front in Australia, cutting taxes and significantly reducing tape and regulation. Importantly, entrepreneurs would then invest, create revenue, create sustainable jobs and raise living standards. This would beautifully position our country on the global stage to supply China, ourselves and our neighbours. Thank you.